Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Sandy Barber's press conference. Uh, we'll, we'll go over and start with an opening statement from Sandy. Uh, and then our first question will come from Mark Brennan. Thanks, KP. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, as we've done for, or as I've done for the last, uh, you know, 18 months or so, I hope, uh, number one, I appreciate you I engaging uh, this morning with this and hope you and your families are, uh, are all safe and, uh, and healthy and, and doing well. Um, this is, uh, you know, I just got through, just ran over from the hub and where I was welcoming um, our new student athletes and, uh, and their families. And it's really an exciting time for us. And, and I think the, <laughs> the, the right word is, uh, you know, is forward. We're, we're moving forward. It's a, it's a direction um, in and of itself. It's a, it's a pace. Uh, and we just had uh, Thursday night our first um, counting uh, competition with women's soccer beating uh, UMass, uh, one of my alma maters, uh, UMass uh, three to one. So, uh, so we're 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 off and running, and uh, you know it really is about looking looking forward. But but forward is always informed by the past, and uh, you know certainly it's been a challenging and and difficult year and a half. Uh, but as an optimist, I think we you look at it as how much we've learned, and we've learned a lot. And as much as I want want to and we want to uh, go back to something more familiar uh, and, and more typical, um, I think it would be a huge mistake for us not to uh, have, uh, not to make sure that we bring with us um, into that forward movement um, everything, everything that we've learned and certainly some of the specifics around the health and safety standards and COVID and, and the pandemic are, are necessary from a health and safety standpoint, but, but even other things uh, that we've learned about ourselves and about each other and, and about where we are as a society and a world, um, I think are really important for us to uh, to, to take with us. Um, and I'm uh, I would be remiss uh, if I didn't mention it every opportunity. And obviously, this is a big opportunity. Uh, but just uh, how appreciative I am uh, of our staff, our coaches, our student athletes—they've just been terrific um, and uh, really responsible uh, uh, around uh, around health and safety and and taking uh, the pandemic seriously. And you know, and particularly with our students, uh, they're 17 to 22 year olds, so that's, that doesn't mean it's without uh, some uh, some incident. But in the main, um, uh, really focused on their ability to. Pete uh, and, and their ability to get a Penn State education, which is uh, what they came here for. So I'm, I'm very appreciative. A lot of hard work by our staff and coaches, uh, a lot of support from our university uh, and our community, and uh, so very appreciative uh, from, uh, for Dr. Barron's support and, uh, and that of, uh, of our co community. Probably in that forward look, what we're uh, most excited about is, uh, is welcoming fans back. They're such a huge part of who we are uh, and, uh, and how we do what we do and the success uh, that we've historically had. So, uh, so looking forward to that. And I know from the interactions that I've had uh, that they are uh, they're excited uh, to be back too. And, and, and so, so looking forward uh, to, to that. Um, you know, from a health and safety standpoint, um, we are uh, uh, we are really looking at for the last 18 months. It's been uh, it's been COVID's been the umbrella, and everything else we do is kind of plugged into that. I, I think we're shifting that a little bit, and uh, again, looking back, looking at something more more familiar uh, to what uh, is typical for us, um, and then making sure, obviously, uh, that the health and safety standards uh, plug into that and uh, and are part of everything we do. A uh, couple of just the last last things that are. Uh, Kind of today's uh, topics, name, image, and likeness um, uh, that uh, uh, that the NCAA and in our case the state of Pennsylvania uh, launched in uh, on on July 1st. Our program is called Statement. Make your statement, um, and it's really focused on uh, on entrepreneurship. Yes, it's uh, it enables our student athletes uh, uh, to accrue benefits uh, at this point in their lives and, and their careers. Um, but it's also focused on making sure that they acquire skills uh, and that uh, that will help benefit them for for a lifetime. And and we just believe that that really fits uh, what Penn State has always done with our student development and welfare programs and, and our life skills, uh, etc. So excited about that, and and. Uh, 
uh, again, like everything we do, excited about the role that 750,000 living alumni uh, will, will play on that. I mean, that's Penn State's advantage. That's, uh, that's our student athletes' advantage in almost everything, whether it be fans in the stands cheering them on, whether it be career opportunities, or in this specific case, it, it'd be the opportunity to capitalize uh, on their, their name, image, and likeness. Um, and then finally, um, just the latest example of Penn State having an opportunity to shine on the worldwide stage, and, and that would be the 2020 uh, Tokyo Olympics that took place in 2021. Uh, but uh, obviously, uh, our four, four gold medalists, uh, our silver medalist, and, and our, our bronze uh, medalist. And, and then, you know, for me, I think it's crazy that, uh, that coaches don't get medals. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously, we had, uh, uh, we had an alumni coach uh, uh, in, in uh, women's basketball with Japan and, and Tom Hovass and, uh, and then Erica uh, Dombach with uh, USA Women's Soccer um, and then obviously our, our entire wrestling staff uh, with USA Wrestling, frankly, uh, with uh, both Penn State alums as well as the Nittany Lang uh, Wrestling Club. So just uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty prominent example. It's a huge example. It's one we're very proud of. Obviously, the role I play with the uh, uh, Collegiate Advisories Council uh, with the USOC uh, connects me a little bit uh, more closely with the USOPC. Um, but but uh, a shining moment for Penn State uh, with, with the Olympics. So um, I could go on and on about uh, how excited I am about certain things and, and certainly some challenges as well as, uh, as successes at Penn State. But uh, I know you guys, uh, men and women, uh, want to get uh, to your questions. So we'll let uh, KP guide us through that. Absolutely. Uh, we will be going through the RSVP uh, question list. We'll start with Mark Brennan from Lions 247 with Fight On State, and then we'll go to Greg Pickle. Are you with us, Mark? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I was uh, playing mute unmute with Chris there. I was a little uh, <laughs> quick on the trigger finger. I apologize. Thanks for doing this, Sandy. All, go all good. Glad to uh, see your reflexes are still intact. Well, not really. But hey, uh, has the Big Ten decided how it's going to handle games that may be canceled due to COVID? Are forfeits in play? And what is Penn State's take and your take on how that should be handled? Uh yeah, I don't know uh, whether uh, whether the Big Ten. Uh, I apologize. Um, I, w I was on a, a trip late uh, late in the week. Um, I know we've we've discussed it, and I think we're we're very close. And I don't think you'll. Uh, I think there'll probably be so, some subtle differences um, between what you've seen from some of the other conferences. Um, but essentially, uh, we will revert back to what our forfeiture policy um, has always been as a conference. Um, and and I think um, although. Perhaps not ideal, given given the the uh, the seriousness, obviously uh, uh, the health and science nature of COVID. Um, it's uh, it's probably the right thing to do. Greg Pickle, and then we'll go to Audrey Snyder. Good afternoon, Sandy. Thanks for doing this. Absolutely, Greg. Good to see you. Except all I see is Greg Pickle. So yeah, the screen recording doesn't allow to turn the camera on. Um, Fans are going to be obviously back at Beaver Stadium here in less than a month. What do they need to know when they come from a health and safety perspective? Some schools have mandated vaccines or negative COVID tests. Will Penn State do that? And then what other things should they know, be it mask indoors or things of that nature? Yeah, that uh, you know the the required vaccination is uh, is not in our plan uh, at this point. We've been following uh, the the CDC and and you all know quite well uh, what we've done as a as a campus um, as it relates to to masking um, indoors. Uh, you, you know, I think from uh, uh, what our fans can uh, can look forward to to seeing is uh, you know there are several uh, kinds of um, uh, adjustments, if you will, as they relate to COVID, um, but from Frankly, they also relate just to, to overall uh, experience for our fans. We've expanded uh, some of our gates um, to uh, to make the the entry um, not not only um, uh, more expeditious just overall, but but also again from a, from a COVID standpoint in terms of not standing uh, in in uh, in lines, uh, magnetometers uh, to make that go. Uh, go more more swiftly. We certainly are, and we've been doing this for several years. Um, but we certainly are encouraging our fans to get in earlier again to to uh, to try to limit the times that we've got uh, significant lines and and perhaps congestion, as you might call it, um, in uh, uh, at our at our gates. I mean, let's face it, we're trying to get 107,000 uh, people in, so we need the the biggest. Um, 
uh, solution there um, is to uh, try to spread that out over time. So whether it's playing games on the uh, uh, on the video board um, if uh, if we're a game later in the day, or it's uh, trying to incentivize and encourage folks from a, a concession standpoint, uh, we're going to do everything we can to spread that out so that we don't have congestion. Uh, again, some construction at uh, at our gate E. Uh, to, I think fans will will really appreciate uh, that. Those that would be entering um, in that section. Uh, certainly, if uh, we're, we're not going to require masking outdoors unless the CDC were to change uh, its guidance, we certainly would uh, would monitor and uh, and review that. Um, but if if someone feels that uh, that that's what they want to do uh, from a sa uh, health and safety standpoint, wear a mask. Um, that that certainly is uh, is encouraged. Audrey Snyder, The Athletic, and then we'll go to Rich Scarcella. Hey, Sandy, um, I wanted to ask you kind of about, about the uh, potential ripple effect here with Texas and Oklahoma. Um, do you feel like the Big Ten aligns well with the Pac-12 and ACC specifically? Um, and would that be a good fit should that alliance come to fruition? Uh, you know, I, I think that this is a really interesting time as it relates to um, what, you, what you're calling the ripple effect from Texas and Oklahoma. I don't know that you've seen much ripple uh, yet. Um, I, think, uh, I think this is different from some of the other expansion periods um, that, that we've experienced. You know, I know the Big Ten feels like it's in a really good place. Um, but having said that, whether it's this week or last week or something uh, after uh, the Oklahoma and Texas announcement, or it's the two months prior to that. It, it's something that I know since I came back to the conference in uh, 2014 um, and, and leaving one of those other conferences uh, that, uh, that we've certainly been, been paying attention to. And it's, it's all about what brings value. And I'm not just talking about money. Certainly money is important. Um, but I'm not just talking uh, about money. What, what institutions or what steps that, that we could take would bring value uh, to our conference? Um, and I do think uh, that there are conferences out there uh, that uh, that bring that that could bring value from a monetary standpoint, particularly speaking um, about the uh, uh, our our television contract and our, our television revenues, but also from you all know the importance of uh, to to us and to the Big Ten of kind of this concept around like-minded uh, institutions. Uh, the Big Ten. Um, uh, really prides itself on being more than just an athletics conference. Conference in terms of of our provosts get together. We you know we share some library resources, some other academic resources. If you look at that footprint of Pac-12, uh, ACC, and uh, and Big Ten, I think the number is 40. Uh, uh, or no, it's it's 40 percent of uh, of the AAU uh, membership. Uh, uh, lies in those three conferences. So I think there are, again, I'm not, I'm not trying to downplay the, the, the importance of, uh, of uh, value as it relates to upsizing our revenues. That absolutely uh, certainly is important. But that's not the only reason. And, and I think that, uh, that there are some, uh, uh, some reasons around like-mindedness like that would be very valuable to the conference. We'll go to Rich Scarcella, and then we'll go to Heather Dinich. Hi, Sandy. How are you? There he is on the screen. Rich, good to see you. Good to see you as well. I just want to clarify something. Will fans be required to wear masks in the concourses, at concession stands, restrooms, that sort of thing, at games? And, and also, just to clarify, the capacity crowds, that's not changing. You're, you're going with capacity crowds. We we are planning. Uh, our our plan is is for uh, for capacity. I'm, I mean, I remember last spring saying we want to get to the point where everyone who wants and can get a ticket uh, can can come in, and and that's that's where we stand right right now. Um, to your first question about about masking, uh, we consider the concourses an outdoor an outdoor area, an open air area, um, and, and that obviously we rely upon uh, the, the medical experts and, and it's, it's about airflow, et cetera. Um, the uh, in, indoor areas in our suite tower and our, and our press tower um, will, uh, are considered indoor and will require uh, mask wearing. Heather Dinich, and then we'll go to Mike Porman. Hey, Sandy, what are your lingering concerns that you have as far as it relates to the football season? Can you hear me? Yeah, Heather, I, I, you're kind of garbled. 
I'm asking if you can say what concerns do you have as far as it still relates to COVID and the football season? And if you can share what the, the vaccination rate is for the team, I don't know if you've said that. Got it. Yeah, I mean, you know, my concerns are the same as that we all have uh, for, for our community and that that, uh, that we be smart and, and we use, use good judgment as it relates to the science. And But, uh, you know, we're seeing all over, literally all over the world, uh, where fans are coming back together um, and, uh, and we're seeing very little uh, uh, COVID-related uh, issues. So I am, uh, I'm, I'm very hopeful and, and forward uh, thinking and, and, and forward looking uh, as it relates to uh, us being back together with our fans that we've missed uh, so, so desperately. And, and I know they've missed our student athletes. Um, as it relates to, uh, to vaccine rate, not unlike what we did uh, a year ago with our testing rates, uh, we are not, uh, we are not going to be in the, uh, in the game or in the habit um, of, uh, of uh, putting out our team uh, vaccination rates, uh, team by team rates. We will, I will do today, I will give you today our departmental rate uh, for, uh, it, it's a combined students and, uh, and our tier one uh, employees. And as we stand uh, today, that is at 82.2% uh, for, uh, for those folks. And uh, you know that does not include as fully vaccinated some of our folks that we, some of our students in particular, uh, that we do know have received their first vaccine um, and have not yet received their second, so they don't, they don't, they're not uh, categorized as fully vaccinated. So obviously we know that 82.2 um, already will move up, is guaranteed to move up, um, and, and then certainly we believe that more and more uh, will, will continue to make the decision to get vaccinated. So we sit at 82.2 today. Um, this is, this is the only time, since, since we give you all a benchmark, this is the only time that we as a department will be uh, will be uh, talking about uh, these figures again will not uh, our coaches um, and other staff members will not be talking about program by program certainly if individuals want to uh, tell you that they're vaccinated or that they're not or that they're not going to talk about it all of those are choices uh, <laughs> uh, they can do that uh, but uh, but we won't be talking about it on a program by program basis again not dissimilar to what we did with testing last year Mike Porman, then we'll go to Corey Geiger. Thanks, Chris. Uh, hi, Sandy. How are you? Mike, I'm good. I love that view. Yeah, I do too. Thanks. <laughs> uh, uh, do you think Penn State ICA is fully meeting its Title, obli title IX obligations to your women athletes, especially in comparison to your Big Ten brethren? And can you note any progress you've made in that direction since you came aboard in 2014? Thanks. Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and uh, y you know I don't I don't think it's ever met. Um, I think it's always a, uh, a a work in progress, and uh, and obviously as you're you're very well uh, aware because you're you're well versed in, in this. You know there there are a number of different buckets um, as it relates to, uh, to to Title IX, uh, and you know one of them is what are the what are the benefits uh, that our students uh, that in this case uh, the underrepresented sex are our female students. Um, someday the underrepresented sex will be men. I promise. <laughs> um, um, and uh, you know, are we providing them on a on a day to day basis with uh, with, with uh, uh, quality coaching, uh, with uh, facilities, with uh, modes of travel? Uh, they call it the laundry list. Um, and again, I think that's something that needs care and feeding every day. Uh, but I feel I feel very good uh, about where we are there. Um, the uh, the other kind of prominent one um, is uh, is the participation rates, um, and, and that's one where where I think we've we've struggled. Uh, and uh, the the thing I feel uh, good about uh, is that even though we probably have not met. Uh, the numbers that we need to to meet strict proportionality. Um, it's not because uh, uh, female student athletes haven't had an opportunity. Um, our uh, women's programs um, are are never capped. Uh, they have the, they're actually given floors as targets uh, for uh, to to help us try to get to the numbers where we need to be from a proportionality standpoint. But I know in my time, and I don't believe I've ever heard in anything that preceded me uh, that uh, that we've ever 
capped our, our, our women's programs. Um, so it's, uh, it's not, uh, we need to keep working at it. Uh, we need to, uh, to, uh, to really um, uh, think about how we get to uh, that better place in terms of proportionality. Now we're, uh, as an institution, I think we're 54 men, 46. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, it, it is a challenge for us uh, because we're, you know, we've got 16 men's sports. Uh, we've got 15 women's. Uh, you know, maybe that needs to, to change. Uh, I will say this. I want to I wanna fulfill our obligations uh, uh, from a Title IX standpoint and, more importantly to me, our obligations to, uh, to our female student athletes. Uh, from by providing them more opportunities and not in not reducing or impacting uh, the, uh, the the men's side. Um, so, but but you you make a, a great point uh, because it is uh, particularly given our number of, of programs and the nature of our programs. It's uh, it's something that uh, that is a challenge for us. Uh, back to, uh, to to your your question. You know there are a number of things uh, that uh, that we've done just in in everyday kind of making sure as we as we check and 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 make sure that things are are equitable. Whether it's uh, you know bringing some of our our charter opportunities for our our women's programs uh, up to snuff, or, or uh, you know, uh, up to, to e equal we equal balance, or, or, or getting closer there. Um, whether it has to do with uh, you know when we made a decision um, to uh, uh, to do cost of attendance, making sure that that was uh, e equitably uh, distributed uh, with all of, of our women's programs. Um, I'm sure there are some additionals, but those are those are some of the ones that come to mind. Corey Geiger, then we'll go to Ben Jones. Hi, Sandy. Will Corey, Penn State, how you hi, doing? Good. Will Penn State be releasing the financial terms of Micah Shrewsbury's contract? And so another part of this, why does the university reveal the football coach's contract terms, but not the men's basketball coach? Uh, that's just that that's our policy. Um, those are, are uh, where we are from a, either either a requirement standpoint or we're certainly meeting our, our requirements. Um, we will not be uh, the two the, the two contracts that uh, that we have stated over and over again uh, that we would make public uh, are the uh, head football coach and athletic director. Ben Jones, and then we will stay on the Jones train and go to Dave. Hey, Sandy, how's it going? <clears throat> Good, Ben. How are you? No complaints. I have a hockey question for you because, of course. Um, the women's hockey program had a lot of success last year in a conference that is nationally not considered to be one of the strongest. The future of Robert Morris hockey is sort of up in the air right now, and they have been traditionally one of the better teams in that league. Do you think you can have success in women's hockey in the CHA, and is there a conversation about sort of what happens next if Robert Morris isn't back for good? Yes and yes. <laughs> um, I, you know, I actually, I actually do. Uh, uh, I think the, the, you know, the access to the NCAs um, is a, is a really important thing, and we certainly have that. Uh, in, in the CHA. Really proud of uh, Coach Campersall and, and the young women in that program and, and the year that they did have. Obviously a breakout, uh, breakthrough year uh, for, for them and we expect that moving forward. Um, having said that, uh, what you referenced with, uh, with Robert Morris uh, certainly uh, gives us uh, um, whether it's cause for concern or opportunity um, to make sure that we understand what all, all what the landscape looks like uh, and what our, our options might be. Um, you know, you all know us well enough to know that we're kind of constantly doing that everywhere um, in everything. And, uh, and, and so, you know, we'll, we'll, be, uh, we'll be analyzing what's, uh, what's always the, the best for, uh, uh, for that, that particular program. I mean, obviously we've got uh, men's uh, men's volleyball, uh, our two fencing programs, and and women's uh, uh, women's hockey that are not in the Big Ten, uh, and, and so those are constant conversations. Dave Jones, and then we'll go to Travis Johnson. Hi, Sandy. There he is, Dave. How are you? How are you? Um, Oregon and Oregon State yesterday announced that they would mandate vaccination proof in order to. Uh, enter their events. This this conversation has obviously been had at Penn State among you and uh, administrators. What was the rationale for not requiring uh, vaccination proof? And is this position intractable 
or malleable in the future? Yeah, let me let me answer the last part first, and and, and that is, and I think uh, you know, Penn State has proven throughout the course of of the last eighteen months that it's constantly uh, making sure that it's it's watching the landscape and and watching the the, the science and the statistics, and uh, and we will we will continue to to do that uh, from a vaccination required vaccination standpoint, and I you know I'm certainly speaking more broadly as it relates to uh, to, to campus. Um, uh, our our campus leader. Our board uh, really felt like uh, the position that we've taken um, is one that balances to the highest degree uh, uh, health and health and safety, um, as well as kind of uh, you know personal choice and uh, and, and individual um, liberties, uh, I if you will. I think it's really interesting that um, as I've kind of looked at this the last week or so, there are lots of places that are saying, uh, and I'm talking about I'm talking about higher ed, um, but actually, as I say this, I'm also talking about organizations, uh, companies uh, that that. Uh, looked a little bit into that are saying they're requiring vaccination um, but when you dig into it uh, yes we're requiring vaccination uh, but if you don't get vaccinated you'll need to be tested uh, re regularly well that's exactly what Penn State is doing um, we are we are saying that if you are not vaccinated uh, you need to test and uh, um, I, I find it interesting that others are saying that's that's vaccinated that that's vaccination required. So uh, you know I think uh, I think Penn State's done a great job uh, of balancing um, obviously the health and safety needs um, as well as everything that's going on and everything else that's going on in our world right now. We realize Travis Johnson's not on the call, so uh, <laughs> New Bias will give you a second to prepare yourself. But uh, you're up, New Bias, and then we'll go to John Sauber. All right, um, are we, we live here? We got you, Nubias. There we go. All hey, right. There we go. So any pleasure to see you. Uh, hopefully get to shake your hand one day. Um, but from there, one thing, can you clarify? I didn't understand. Will there or won't there be forfeits? And then from there, when it comes to getting everything going with the program for football, what are, what are the things that you think will be the most challenging about being able to host that many fans in one place. Uh, yeah, so back to the first. Um, uh, it, it is my understanding that we will, re as a conference, will revert back to our regular um, uh, forfeiture policy, and that is if an institution is not able to essentially show uh, for, the, for the game, that it, uh, for the contest, that it will be a forfeit. Um, and then, I'm sorry, New Bias, what was the second part of your question? Oh, sorry. We'll unmute you, promise. <laughs> My apologies, I was a little um, jumbled there. Uh, what I was asking you just overall, what are the biggest challenges from the city perspective as well as stadium-wise from hosting that many people considering what's going on with the mutations of the, of the COVID and everything? Yeah, I think it's just it's a, it's a matter of, uh, of us all being really smart and understanding um, that uh, that the virus in in some way shape or form is is still with us um, again I'm 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 uh, heartened by uh, the fact that whether it's Major League Baseball or, or uh, you know some others that are that are hosting um, events with large uh, large crowds and without um, to date ma major um, major incidents I do think it's in, important that uh, that we as um, we as event planners and, and, and we as event uh, 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 organizers and, and, and runners, that's not the right term, but um, running events, uh, it, you know, we, we can't act like it's, it's not happening. Um, we, we have to be conscious. Again, it's kind of my, uh, my original description about it's no longer COVID as the overarching um, it's we're having the event and we and we've got to plug the uh, the COVID considerations uh, into it. I, I certainly would encourage um, uh, as as many as uh, and I know there are lots of folks out there that are uh, to be vaccinated. I would encourage folks that want to wear masks to certainly do that. It's not required, um, but I, I certainly don't want someone that wants to wear a mask to feel like that that they're going to be looked at strangely. That that's completely up to you whether you want to or or, or you don't want to. Um, and, and 
I think we just have to be smart and, and understand that uh, the virus is, is, uh, is with us uh, and, uh, and we need to, uh, to use our good judgment around that. But come to Beaver Stadium and, uh, and enjoy, uh, enjoy a football Saturday for the first time in a couple of years. John Sauber, Center Daily Times. Then we'll go to Jerry DePaula. Hi, Sandy. Uh, you mentioned being malleable with your planning. Uh, is it possible for that full capacity plan to change? And if so, what markers are you using to determine any potential changes? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, uh, you know, flexibility, your word, Matt, malleable, um, has, is something that, that certainly has to go along with, uh, uh, with a public health uh, uh, issue like, like COVID. Um, Again, it's not it's not the plan um, at this point. We would have to uh, we would have to see what uh, what the what the advice was from the CDC and our local health authorities, um, and and then you know what the issues are. Whether it be okay, yes, capacity, but uh, the local authorities or you know uh, you know want to go to uh, suggest that we go to, to mask wearing, or if it's something um, from a uh, from from a capacity standpoint. But that's that is not uh, that is not what the plans are at this point in time. Jerry DePaula, and then we'll go to Dave Melandra. Hello, Sandy. How are you today? Thank you for your time. I, pre I appreciate it very much. Absolutely, great to see you, Jerry. Um, I want to look at clarification, if I can, on your, your percentage, 82.2%. Is that 82.2% of all Penn State employees in all departments and students? Is that everybody? No, that is athletic department specific, and that is our student athletes and what we consider to be our tier one employees. And that comes from, uh, that's a term that the Big Ten used last year. Those that those were the, those that were in our daily testing regime, uh, the ones that have uh, the, the daily contact uh, with students student athletes and with the programs. Hey, thank you very much. You're quite welcome. Dave Melandra, USA Today, and then we'll go to John Tietel. Hey, Sandy, got a couple of questions for you. One, if the state or the city comes down and says that capacity of Beaver Stadium this season will have to be reduced, how quickly in advance will you notify those season ticket holders and those fans that have tickets for those games about the, the attendance being dropped, and secondly, for the basketball and hockey season, will fans attending those games require a negative test to attend? Uh, let me take your last one one first, because uh, that that is uh, uh, right now the the only um, change for indoor is the is the mask wearing uh, requirement. Um, so no, there would be no uh, vaccine or negative test re requirement for. I think you referenced basketball and hockey, maybe. Um, and then your your first question, you know, this is this is one of those places where uh, you know what we've learned, and uh, and obviously last year we went through a ton of planning uh, for different capacity sizes, which we still have. Um, that that's not been uh, uh, forgotten or or, uh, or or thrown out. Doesn't mean we we won't have to shift and, and pivot and make some uh, really tough decisions uh, quickly. Uh, but again, that's not um, that's not what we're planning. Um, that's not what you're you're seeing um, out there. Um, and but but we will we will obviously from a health and safety standpoint. Um, continue to monitor uh, and, and look at the advice from both local uh, as well as national and, and worldwide um, as it relates to, uh, to what's in the public health's best interest. John Tiedel, Hoops HD, and then John Petitionock. Uh, thanks, Christina. Uh, good afternoon, Ms. Barber. Um, I wanted to congratulate you on your appointment to the Constitution Committee a couple of weeks ago, and my questions about that. Uh, what do you dislike the most about the current governance model, and what are you most excited to have included in the new governance model? I appreciate the congratulations. Um, are we sure that's what it is? Uh, <laughs> but um, what what I dislike uh, right now is, uh, you know, and I think it's what we're all looking at really, really heavily, um, and, and that is that decisions seem so separated. Uh, from uh, from the boots on the ground, um, and, and probably, and I started to say it, and not necessarily is what I love the most, but it, it actually is. There has been so much progress in the I would say the last five years uh, as it relates to the student athlete voice, 
um, in, in the process. I think that's so important. They're not the be all and the end all. They're not, uh, you know, 17 to 22 year olds don't, don't have the experience that, that, uh, that the rest of us uh, have. But that also doesn't mean we totally shut it out. Their voice has to be there. And it's, I've seen it. I've seen it as the chair of the FOC. I've seen it in, in some of my other uh, committee work, um, both at the conference level and at the NCA level. Their voice matters and it, and it has to be heard. Doesn't mean it has to be absolutely taken, and, but it, ha it has to be put in, into the mix. So um, that's, that's probably the, the, the question for both. But I, I'm uh, to both the dislike and, and, and the like. Um, what, I'm, um, what I'm really looking forward to is I look around, and we had our first Zoom call on Tuesday, I think it was, and I look around that, uh, uh, that Zoom screen and all of the experience, and, and I also know most of those people, whether they be presidents or, or athletic directors or, or others, as people that aren't afraid uh, to, to put their voices out there. I, I think you know, maybe that's why we were, we were chosen. Um, and I don't think this is going to be kind of nibbling at the edges. I think it's going to be bold. Uh, now, you know, I hope I don't have to retract that statement, right? Um, and, and I am very impressed. Um, uh, Secretary Gates will, will lead. He will lead decisively. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to, uh, to, to do the work um, in the next few months uh, under his leadership. Our final two questions will go to John Petitionock and then Daniel Gallen. Hey, good afternoon, Sandy. How are you doing today? Doing well, and yourself? I'm doing well. Appreciate the time. Yeah. Hey, you mentioned the opening women's soccer match, and you also mentioned the Olympics, and that leads into my question. When you look at Erica Dombach behind the scenes and off the field, what is it about her that tells you she's a leader, and what do you see that has propelled her to have as much success as she's had, not just at Penn State, but globally as well? Yeah, you know, Erica, Erica, and I hesitate to say this because we've got so many talented coaches, and so maybe I, I, I create a category here. Um, uh, you know, we've got so many coaches that are, are incredibly talented and have had such great success, but, you know, Erica certainly is in that top category uh, for us, so, um, and it's, um, you know, certainly she's technically sound, um, but... Uh, you know, she's a, she's a fit for Penn State. She she believes in Penn State. She believes in who we are, uh, what we stand for, what our values are. She recruits the right young women um, in, into that. She demands excellence from them, uh, both athletically and academically and socially. Uh, and uh, she's not afraid to hold them accountable. She's not afraid to hold herself accountable. Uh, and she's not afraid to uh, to be um, uh, to evolve. Uh, you know, she's not the coach today that she was 15 years ago. Uh, student athletes aren't the same student athletes that they were 15 years ago. And she and her staff, she's got an incredible staff. She's surrounded herself with great people. Uh, and, uh, and, and they're not afraid uh, to, to evolve uh, as well and do it um, in a way that benefits students. Um, and, when you be and here at Penn State, when you benefit students, you benefit the university and you benefit the community. So... Um, uh, all of that, you know, Erica is absolutely one of our finest. I love, I love working with her. Um, I love how she leads uh, the program. Um, she leads it with conviction. I think that's probably the, the number one thing. She knows who she is. She knows what's important to her. Um, and she leads with conviction uh, and makes sure that, uh, that everyone involved in the program, most importantly, student athletes, understand that. And our final question will go to Daniel Gallen, Penn Live. Hey, Sandy. Uh, nice to meet you. How are you? Doing well. Um, over the past year, we've seen how things can change very quickly. You know, when it comes to the virus, um, you know, we saw it at the Big Ten level last August. Um, over the given the past year, how confident are you in the ability of the Penn State athletic department, and then on a larger scale, you know, the Big Ten, uh, potentially the NCAA, to be able to make changes quickly, to adapt quickly, based on kind of what you've learned this past year. Yeah, I have a high degree uh, of confidence in that. You know, I mean, let's face it. You think about uh, spring of 2020 and, and summer of 2020. Um, this was all really new uh, to us. I kept looking in my office for the pandemic manual. Couldn't find it. Uh, you know, thought maybe the last uh, athletic director or several athletic directors ago would have left it for me, but uh, they didn't. And, um, you know, we think about how much we, we've learned. Um, 
you 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 reference some of the decisions uh, from a, from a Big Ten standpoint. You, you know, we all we, we also had a brand new commissioner uh, who had uh, just taken over full time in in, in 2020. He's learned a lot. We've learned a lot about him. Um, and, and so all of that, uh, you know, given uh, some of the resources and the expertise that we've pulled in, the things we've learned, the things we know now from a science standpoint that we didn't know then, the fact we have a vaccine, uh, the fact that, that uh, you know, all the, all the things that, uh, that we've learned that maybe, maybe we're going to have a booster here that we have uh, that, you know, at, at one point in time it was 18 or 16 and above, and now it's pretty much 12 and above. So, so we're, uh, you know, there's so much that's different that's on that, that, that forward scale that's better um, that, that I do have a high degree of, of confidence. I think, um, you know, the Olympics was a, was a bellwether. Uh, for for me, um, and albeit certainly recognize that they did it without spectators, so that is a that is a significant difference. Um, but uh, you know, they, they here's a world here, here's a, a worldwide stage, uh, in this case located in, in Tokyo, that they'd been concerned about getting up off the ground, um, and there was a, there were some some uh, some challenges um, at the beginning, um, but they uh, had the opportunity to adjust, uh, got it addressed, um, and and they just pulled off. The the biggest sporting event um, in uh, you know that that the Olympics is the largest sporting event um, in in the world and uh, and so all of that gives me uh, gives me confidence not that uh, that we that we won't have to adjust uh, you know we, we, we probably will in some way shape or, or form um, but that we'll be able to um, and that it will properly address so that again we can we can get back to something that's uh, more familiar for us um, as a country, um, and again, you're seeing that uh, right now with, with some of the professional sports and uh, that are that are taking place with with crowds, uh, and uh, and we certainly uh, we certainly saw it um, from an from an Olympic standpoint. So uh, we're uh, we're prepared to uh, to adjust and pivot and uh, be flexible um, and get done what we need to get done. Thank you very much, Sandy. Thanks everybody for joining us this morning. Appreciate your or this afternoon, I suppose it is now. Uh, appreciate everybody's time and uh, look forward to seeing you all in person very soon. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate your time.